hospitality is that depth of giving and, and being there, but I don't care about it unless the technical aspects of service have been complete. You know, over the years watching people that sort of like get down with two guests while, you know, the other sides of the ship are like sinking. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it, if they don't have water and they're waiting for drinks, I don't care that that table is happy with you. You right. know what I mean? I, that's not a win for There's me. There's a system problem. Everybody needs to have just basic technical service. This is Start of the Storefront. Today's guest is Devin Adams, founder of The Townsend, a modern American restaurant in the town of Quincy, Massachusetts. Quincy is rich with American historical sites, and The Townsend sits directly across the street from the burial ground where President John Adams and his son, President John Quincy Adams, are laid to rest. And even though there's no relation, Devin is certainly adding to the Adams legacy in Quincy. Now, I want to give all of you a little backstory to this interview. By the time Diego and I arrived at the Townsend, we had already taped two podcasts that day and had been driving all over the Boston area. This taping was scheduled for when the restaurant closed at midnight. We were tired, cold, and wondering if we'd even have enough energy to make it into the early morning. Our worries were erased as soon as Devin sat down with us. He is a consummate host, and his restaurant is an extension of his hospitable nature. Though, if I'm being honest, it didn't hurt that he uncorked a bottle of wine that entered the world the same year that I did. So listen in as we cover everything from how he shunned the snooty and prim ways of more traditional high-end dining establishments, why training servers to be aware of their surroundings is a crucial step in being hospitable, and why you shouldn't rely on lawyers for business advice. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. We're joining you from Quincy, Massachusetts with the great-grandchild of one of the presidents. Devin Adams is in the building. I think the great-grandchild would probably be dead as well, but yeah, we, can, we can go down a couple more <laughs> great, tiers. Great, 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 great. <laughs> We're here at the town, the Townsend, yep. which is a restaurant here. It is. Devin's been in the game for a long time yep. in food and beverage yep. here in Boston. Kind of a, kind of a staple, frankly. Thank Tell you. me about... Your, well, let's talk about your journey first. So where did you where did you first get into food and beverage? Sure. So my buddy Justin was a bar back at a new restaurant in town called Kingfish Hall, which was, uh, you know, at the time, Master Chef, okay. Grand Chef Todd English, okay. who was famous oh. from Olives. Todd English. Yeah. So he had just opened that up. And, uh, what were you doing there? So I, start, I got in there as a bar back, kind of covering my buddy's, like, college break, and I went from... Uh, Bar back, sort of at that point, probably is where my eyes really lit up with the industry. They had a sommelier, I think his name was Glenn Tanner. The psalm ended up going to Japan. And then there was this hole where this big wine list was just kind of like nobody was dealing with it. The bar manager had left and I had just sort of kind of worked my way up where it was like, okay, I can get orders in, I can do this. And had no one really to uh, mentor or even just get feedback from because the company was just exploding and sure. it was just, you know, really getting thin. So I sort of through frustration and obviously just wanting to have a better understanding, I started, uh, put myself through, uh, school for wine. I went to the international sommelier guild, which no longer exists, but, uh, I put myself through the wine classes and, uh, just started basically ended up taking over the beverage program. Did you become a SOM or what was the, I went through the third series of it. So I did four years and then, uh, I didn't, I didn't pass the last, I was never a student. I w it, it was good for me, uh, to sort of, but you learned enough, I guess, I learned a for lot. what you needed to yeah. do. Yeah. Really what I took out of it was more of, uh, the kind of analytical process that I never thought about before. Okay. You know, I think when you start really getting into wine and breaking it down and you're in the restaurant business, it, it, immediately translate into all the food that you're eating, especially with wine pairing and everything else. So really? you really just start to look at okay. all beverage, all things. And then, you know, it, it goes as far as like, well, how is the table set? How should it be? And, you know, really breaking those things down if you're going to be really concise about it. But I, I always knew I was just never really of that mindset to really go that distance and, and, and be that bookworm about it. It was yeah. always to me about being comfortable in the restaurant, making people comfortable and not just, spewing out a bunch of technical facts yeah so there from kingfish i went and took over the beverage program at luca in the north end which was another sort of big 
Italian American wine list, like five to 600 different uh, bottles on the list. Okay. Vintage stuff. Where'd you go after Luca? Uh, so Luca, I went to Island Creek. So then when you got to Island Creek, what was your, what was your role there? So at that point I had probably been managing bars for eight years and the whole point there was to step back. There was always this kind of feeling that like some people just naturally understand hospitality. Like you might walk into someone's house and they just sure. naturally are like, Hey, I made these cookies and you know, here's some tea and blah, blah, blah. And you might walk into someone else's house and it's like a, a fucking disaster. And they're, you know, right. it's like they're, they don't even know, they don't even care that you're there kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And like how that transitions into how you welcome people into your home is also just like as a, a waiter or a waitress or a bartender, some people just naturally have that. And you're like, Oh wow, they're, they're a great bartender. You know, it's always sort of about like seizing opportunities, but it, it, it really was this like scientific breakdown of hospitality, which sort of sounds like, well, how are you making something that should occur naturally and be giving into this like science of opportunities? I never really had to think about that because I just always wanted to make sure the guests in front of me was just like they had everything they needed and right. I was ahead of them as far as their thinking. So you sort of have that. But then you get into the point where it's like, oh, I think the famous one I still use was them talking about like, oh, you have a, um, a couple at your bar or at your table that uh, you know that they're, they've got a babysitter and they've only got an hour and a half. And they're like, you know what? We got to get back to the sitter. We're going to have to skip out on dessert. And it's like you can fire two cookies to go from up there and on their way out be like, hey, guys, you know, and it's like, holy shit. That's like, an awareness though. Like, how are you teaching that awareness? How are you baking that? You, right. You're, you're teaching people to be aware of that. We would, fact. we would do these role playing exercises. We would, you know, it was just okay. like over, so there was and over and over again. This happens Thanks, all sir. the time. Like I remember I'll be meeting with people in any capacity and I always notice if their glass is empty, mm. but what I'm paying attention to is time. Right. My thing is like their glass is empty. Do they need to leave? Yeah. And so as soon as they're getting low, I'm like, hey, do you have a hard stop? Or like, can we have another one, yeah. right? Right before they're done and they're yeah. just staring at me yeah. and their mouth is getting dry. But like that, that's an awareness. Yeah. And um, not everybody has that. I've, I've managed sales teams and I've tried to make people aware of that. Like this guy's been fidgeting with his watch for 30 minutes and you just stared at him and continue to lecture. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. Did you not get that? Did yeah. you, are you not watching the same movie? Yeah. And they're like, I had no idea. Yep. The, and I'm the like, whole, how do we, how do you, I'm, how do you teach that? Yeah. The whole but suite of like nonverbal, you know, that it's everything. It, it's, it's, it's insane. And it's, there's, it's just so much to it that it's just, you, you know, in, in finding that it's like, Hey, this happened with this guest and it's a mistake and it's a problem. What are the steps to, to write it instead of really before it would just kind of be like, eh, their day's ruined, you know? Right. Instead of literally like. You know, and you hear it over and again. It's the Danny Myers, it's the Garrett Harker, but it's just sort of just like that's a no, that's an opportunity. Something went wrong. That means we have an opportunity to fix it and correct it. And what I talk about here with the staff as well is is understanding. You know, hospitality is that sort of like that depth of giving and and being there. But I don't care about it unless the technical aspects of service have been complete. I've you know, over the years watching people that sort of like get down with two guests while, you know, the other sides of the ship are like sinking. Yeah. And it's like how much that drives me crazy to be like, because in the end of it, like we want to go out, we're going to go have dinner. I just want to get everything that I need. You know, if, if it's bonus time and you know, my bartender is just awesome and he's, and he's on it. It's like, and we get to make a connection. That's great. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it, if you're not, if, if they don't have water and they're waiting for drinks, it, it's just for me, I don't care that that table is happy with you. Right. You know what I mean, I, that's not a win for There's me. There's a system. Problem. Everybody needs to have just basic technical service. Everyone needs to have water. It's it like, takes the pressure off too. So as you've been explaining this, if you have the technical skills in place yeah. that you don't have to be the nicest yeah. guy. Yeah. Because you're not relying on your niceness and your, let's call them your natural abilities. Yep to win them over. You're yep. relying on the system. And you are consistent. And right. that's what everyone wants to And everyone to else on your team yep. is in the same boat. Yep. I show up on time. I'm 15 minutes early. My clothes are ironed. You know, it just all, so much of it starts 
way before your shift. You know, it's just, and you, and you just kind of, you can see it like, oh, that guy didn't want to iron his shirt today. It's like, <laughs> you know, what happened? But, Rainer. You know, but it's just one of those things. And, and that's part, like, I talk to old timers in the business that are, are like, you know, they used to do the the, the fingertip test for, before they started their shift. Mm. Your nails are dirty. Beat it. Yeah. You know, when I worked at, when we were working at Kingfish, our GM, you know, it was like, if your uniform was black socks, if you had white socks on, get the fuck out of here. You know, you do that today if people are like, I can't believe you treat me like that. It's like, <laughs> it's in your handbook. It's what you're supposed to, it's what your uniform is. Right. You could say that it seems like it's minuscule, but it's, it's, it's an act that ripples across. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, last week she didn't, she had white socks on. So I figured I'd, you know, I don't have to shave anymore, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> you're like, what? But that's just kind of like, that's how these things start to happen. And I think, you know, you see, you see the structure that they put in place. And I think so. That was like the the thing you learned. That was your takeaway there. And yeah. then, as well as I probably making amazing cocktails. And yeah, I mean, like the, the cocktails, it, it, the culture. You know, I think especially like being in the North End and in in uh, Faneuil Hall, which are were very you know again transient. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely had a great culture in the bar at Luca because the North End still has a lot of you know everyone still lives there. It's almost. Uh, I was living in it at the time. It was probably a little too almost incestuous. It was just you knew everyone and yeah, you walk down the street any time of day, you're seeing them. It was kind of that thing. Yeah. It's 100 feet from work. So it was actually a nice relief to be like, all right, I'm across the city now. But yeah, I think, you know, the the cocktails for sure. I mean, I had never even heard about like proportion theory and like how. What does that mean? You know, what is proportion theory? The idea of like, uh, call it like a classic sour drink new york sour daiquiri whatever yeah there's a idea that like you know i think jackson would work off like one and a one and a half three quarter three quarter every drink's based on three ounces primarily not all of them but these cocktails are based off of three mm. ounces this is how you impact the flavor profile if you change the syrup if you change the citrus um so it was it was a language it was a culture um and it you know you just start to pick these things up you start to figure out you know i'm jiggering you know how do all these things make sense within all of that structure? And I mean, you know, at, at the time, you know, Tom and Jackson and that, they were just so gung ho and, and ruthless for a good reason, because they knew that they had to yeah. have that Eastern standard. Like we couldn't, we couldn't just be like, Oh, Eastern standards, you know, it's a shitty its own thing. Right. Yeah. A toity -toity. Oh, they have oysters, whatever, you know, <laughs> um, that was big for me. I think that was, you know, one of those points where it was like, okay, and I did it, and I did it well. Yeah. Um, Hell yeah, you did. Best naked and famous around. That's my drink. So delicious. And then you went to drink. And then I went to drink, yeah. What made you yeah. want to go to drink? To learn something new again, or so is it another step back? And I had gotten, so the little blip there is I had gotten close. I was I moved back to Southie. So probably throughout this whole time, I lived in the North End for a couple of years, but I primarily lived in South Boston. Mm -hmm. And South Boston just started to go crazy. In terms of real estate value, real estate, yeah, just it was everything. Up. And I, I knew, like, when I was living there in Faneuil Hall, like, when I first moved to South Boston, I was paying like four twenty five a month in rent for mm, a room. And a steal. if there was a blizzard, or if like I could walk home, and I just started to realize that, like, oh, I can walk from Faneuil Hall and get into Southie in like forty minutes, mm -hmm. which sounds like a lot, but it's really not. You yeah. know, you're walking through the city; it's nice. But right. I just started to realize, like, the red line's there. This is here seaport through the years it sort of like started off where it was like oh there's just the music venue down there and you'd go see a show every year and then all of a sudden there's a new hotel there's another hotel still not much down there but every year i could see this and um always in my mind was like they need like a franklin cafe or something here there's all this a bunch of industry people they need something that's just like not one of these kind of like shitty irish taverns mm -hmm. or what they had were these like kind of like family run sort of like 99 ish type things. And it was, it was just all <laughs> awful. Yeah. It was like all these Russian pizza places that just, you know, didn't make any sense. So it was always on my mind. Like, you know, I got to get something in the Southie. Like it's happening. Yeah. Everybody's looking for like, we need a late night food spot. We need a place that's just not a bunch of, you know, not to say that it was all a bunch of animals, but it was just like a, it was a, just a boozing culture that was mm -hmm. like, okay, this is all we got. Um, so I had, while I was at Island Creek, started dipping my toe. We found a spot. We got a lease in front of us. Uh, I went to the city and 
went through the process of figuring out what a what a beer and wine license was. We were going to do like a little small plate type place, just beer and wine. Mm -hmm. wasn't going to be a, a JMO uh, Guinness spot type of thing. We were just okay. switched up a little bit. Okay. And we started doing the community meetings, the outreach, meeting with the, all the local reps. Um, and unfortunately, the system was basically like, okay, we really like you, actually. We like what you have to say. Um, <laughs> we're going to push this through for you, but it typically takes six to nine months. Right. Um, and, you know, we were, at the time, my, my buddy Vanik and his dad, we were sort of putting together a business plan and, and trying to figure it out. And uh, it, you know, the end, the end of it was, is we put in a shit ton of work. We met with every government agency. We met with the community twice. You know, meeting with the community was like super stressful, but it was also like, they, you know, the only people that show up to community meetings are people that have been there for a hundred years that have nothing else to do. Totally. And it taught us to reach out to our friends that live there, have them show up to the meetings for the second one, because the first one we were just badgered by everyone. Yeah. Well, how much are the, how much is the steak going to be? And what are you going to charge for a bud? And it was yeah. like, I don't even think I'm going to sell bud. You know, it was just like that type of stuff where the, the community that was there, you really had to argue to be like, Hey, no, we're here. Like, mm-hmm. We want to we want to give great service. We want to take care of people. We just don't think that it needs to be, you know, families don't need to come in here while a bunch of guys are again drinking JMO and Guinness. Right. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, but there can be another suitable area for these people like myself that live here that are going to probably start a family here to be able to feel comfortable and that it's not there just eating at a bar. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you go back to your landlord and you're like, yeah, looks like it's all going to work out, but it could take up to nine months. And okay. it was like, oh. You know, I can help you guys a little, but to be honest, I got a Froyo guy that's going to be here tomorrow. So I think that's the best way to go. And yeah. Like, Ugh. And then, you know, you start, you backtrack. There's not a lot of real estate coming up at the time that fits what we would have needed. Um, and then I, basically at that point, I knew that, okay, I've got my business plan. I've got my specs out. You know, I've, I've had the discussions. I'm going to continue to look there. And Island Creek, you know, God bless them, but they, you know, they they want all of you right? and, and you kind of have to give all, all of it to them. Um, but I had been Smart. there long enough and kind of figured it out. I worked, you know, I was working on the hardest station and kind of, you know, I just knew, I knew how to do it. But when you start, you know, I've been married, married and starting to think about having a family and it's like, are they still going to make me work Saturday and a double Sunday? Are they still, you know what I mean? And you just, you just get to that point where it's like, I, I know now where I'm going. Right. Um, and, you know, you guys aren't going to allow me to step back. And they wanted me to take a position as a leadership role there. And I just didn't feel comfortable committing it. Yeah. Um, Knowing that you wanted to do yeah, something. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, they're... It is all you, in. I like that they knew that too. I mean, for yeah. both part parties, right? It's yeah. like you're both doing yourself a disservice if you're thinking about starting your own thing. And yeah. for the excellence that they require, Yeah, it's smart of them to know that they need you all. And, and that's... And if you're not, I mean, it's, it's one of those honest. places that it's like stressful to take a vacation. Okay. Because you know you're going to come back and so many things have changed and you're just out, you know, and it takes you that few days just to kind of like, okay, I'm back in it. I mean, Island Creek. Interesting. The menu is different every day. Right. They printed a menu every day, you yes. know, and the wine list was, you know, fairly esoteric because they were trying to push people into these boundaries of, of different things, which was great mm -hmm. because for them, that's developing culture. Um, it's something I talk about here where, you know, this market's different but the sort of nobody sees bone marrow on the south shore say something like that you know what i mean and those are just specific markers or, or maybe someone's never had uh i don't know something do you think a lot about culture <clears throat> yeah it's 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 i think about it all the time because people are either in or they're out um you know they either but in terms of like the the, the culture that faces the public and so when it comes to your menu when you think about culture do you think about it like you're taking everything that you discovered, all of your own training mm -hmm. from Boston, working in the city. Yeah. You're bringing it out here and you're, you're introducing it, right? You're, a part of you is introducing culture yeah. to the people here. Yeah, and the first time that we did that, people told us that we weren't going to make it. You know, sort of like you bring the drink program cocktails down where it's, again, it's three ounces. You're still, there's still just as much booze in it, but it's actually balanced. You know, you're, oh, it's, it's a two half, half build. So yeah. go back to the proportion theory thing, one and a half, three quarter, four, and then maybe then, then drink was more of a stronger build, a two half, half. But people would see this beautiful antique 
glass and then it's like you're not gonna make it no this doesn't work down here and you just you just kind of <laughs> like all right well the next one's on us or there's no check and you, you just kind of have to ingratiate yourself but i think you know you we've made so many changes being in Quincy as the market is just to sort of figure that out. And, and honestly, like going back to Island Creek, we opened going into baseball season with no butter Bud Light. I think Eastern Standard had Bud and Bud Light. They didn't put on their menu, but they had it. Okay. So you, you had know, to know. You learn all these things, you get to this sort of high tier, right? And you're like, and, and I think that's the best thing that you can do is, is try to get as far as you can, even though it's not you, just so you have an understanding of like, you know, I might come down a little bit, but here's 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 mm. a standard that I'll, I'll live by, mm -hmm. um, that I can deal with on a daily basis. Because I I was never going to be the person that's going to go in and you know be at like a montan where I'm in a suit and right right. You know, Super I think formal. the first time we went there, I always laugh about it because it was like the only thing the server said to me was, "It's my pleasure only." And like I've probably heard that like four different times when he was like, <laughs> I was just like, "That's all I'm going to get out of this guy tonight," and you know, it's just. Kind of crazy, you know. I like, haven't I been never, there actually. It's I like one place I've never that. been. There's, I'm there's, a t-shirt and jean guy, and that's it, right? And so, like, I mean, I had a bow tie thing for a little while. You but did. I would. I you would. Just, I just don't like. I don't like the stuffiness. No, it's not my thing. It's and not that's why me. they've all dropped off. I mean, Montan's changed. Right. Let, Les Boyer closed. Ajoutui closed. You know, all of the all of that kind of classic French stuffiness. All of that, uh, you know. We talk about it all the time, which is, I'm sorry, I'm way off course here, but culturally, I feel like we've, we've always been entranced with that, like, and, and it makes sense, that sort of French culture where it's like, oh, and then the next dish comes down and the rest of the friggin' universe is like, put all the food on the table and let's share it. And it's, it's just like, it's now kind of getting here mm. and it makes so much sense. But I look at different generations where it's like, yeah, you guys should just get a bunch of this food and just all share it. And it's like... This is my appetizer. This is my, yeah, you can have a little piece of it, you know? And it's like, <laughs> get the food on, like just order a bunch of food, right? put it on the table. It's how everybody wants to eat and just go from there. And it's, it's just a, it's, it's in, it's changing, yeah. but it's just an interesting thing that we've all in, in, I think that's why you're seeing, you know, all those places close down because people just aren't, it's, it's like, yeah, three hours of like, here's a plate, here's a plate, like. I used to think it was interesting that like you'd go to a place like that and they'd make you sit with your drink for like 10 minutes and you'd almost start to think like, is service that happened faltering? To me. It was like, did they forget yeah. about our food? So now order and another just, drink. They just pace you out yeah. and it's like, oh. And then it's like, it's almost like you don't even really start relaxing and having a good time until like you're getting towards like your dessert course because you finally have had a couple glasses. We didn't of even make it there. We got to like course four and I was yeah, like, like, please send me the rest to go. <laughs> Give it to me in the bag. <laughs> All that stuff comes uh. through. All that stuff where it's like, oh, they do this table side or they do this, that. And it's like, I don't know, man. I, I you know, I get I, it. I see it. Yeah. Thank you. What, what are we, what are we drinking right now? What is this? This is 1987. I thought, yeah, I thought I might hit your birthday, but I didn't. I failed you again. I'm a 97 baby yeah. for people Eight. listening. <laughs> 87 Gergich Cabernet. So older California Cabernet. Can you put some more in there? I can put plenty of it in there for you. So roughly a 32-year-old Cab Sov. 32-year-old Cab, as I was going to say earlier, it's, uh, these are fun because they made them more towards like a Bordeaux style, so the alcohol is a little bit lower. They are meant to age. You do find that uh, the older... California mm. cabs and stuff, they, they drink really well. This one's more subtle now, this sip. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Ooh. So, so you go start moving, seeing the texture because yeah. the tannins mm. have dissipated. The tannins, which you don't taste, everybody. You can't taste tannins, <laughs> according to Devin. He corrected me you, earlier. You today. can't smell them. You can't smell them. Yeah. yeah. You can't yeah. smell them. You, you only can, taste them. You can taste them. Shit. Maybe some people can. Yeah. I think they I say I, that <laughs> <laughs> no. So when you were first thinking about opening this place up, yeah. were, were you always set on Quincy? I was set on the fact that I knew I wasn't going to have a budget to open in Boston. Yeah. And after where being you want to be versus what your dollars allow. Yep. And after being a drink and obviously just after realizing that like you're going to make money on alcohol. Yep. Um, and having an understanding of like why drink was just a cash cow, you know, it, the margins that they can run there and what they get away with, not what they get away with. I mean, well, easy <laughs> what they do there very well. Um, you you just start to realize that you gotta you gotta sell you gotta sell alcohol. Um, totally, beer and wine will do okay for you, but you know, 
you make your margin on booze. Alcohol pencils. Yeah. yeah. And so you knew that that was going to be part of one of <clears throat> part of the restaurant. It had to be. I mean, I drink was just such a, and I think going from Island Creek into drink where, you know, I was always like a really highly structured, uh, bartender and just restaurant person in general mm -hmm. drink was kind of, um, much more kind of organic and just, it's like, Hey, it's at your own pace. You know, you're, everyone's going to start as a food runner bar back. Then you, you know, you sort of have your apprentice, then your bartender, then your lead and blah, 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 blah. Right. But how long you stay in each role is completely dependent on your progression. Exactly. Right. And I think going from like, we're at Island Creek. I was always on this like little dining bar, which was a poorly designed station that was like, Oh, you're the service bartender for the big half of the dining room. And you have 10 <laughs> seats that are like high touch dining right. where it should kind of be the opposite where it's like, Oh, there's some people cocktailing and I've got this service bar. Right. Uh, so it was always just a, it was a, it was a crazy station to work and you had, you just, you had to get in and get it in a rhythm and otherwise your night could just get fucked. And it, that's just the worst feeling. You know, that you, when I, <laughs> When I talk with like some people that talk about like server dreams and stuff like that, and you like you wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, I fucking forgot that drink <laughs> on C two, and you know, it's just you would have those kind of nightmares. I remember having a nightmare where like I was, uh, I woke up and my bed was in that dining bar area and it was just like sinking, and <laughs> people were yelling at me for stuff, and it was just like it I was can that visualize so, that, yeah, yeah. Like brutal. So going to drink was kind of. Uh, it was the the sort of switch in maturity level that I needed also just to kind of get out of just being kind of like a machine right? and getting into like, hey, this is who I am. This is my voice. This is what I like. And really, when I look at drink, what I fell in love with was that the challenge of not necessarily being challenged that someone's going to come in and be like, oh, I like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you name you know it. whatever, like whatever the one we used to talk about, like dreams and unicorns or whatever. And you just be like, yeah, OK. Yeah. But it was sort of uh the engagement that I could pursue there that was more part of my personality of being like, yeah, so what do you like to drink? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, well, how old are you? Well, I'm 32. You're 32 years old and you don't know what you like to drink. We should get on that right away. You know, and just sort of like, just slyly bust Devin people's was really balls. good at that. He was really good at making you feel good despite... All the shade he was throwing you at the same time, and they but they got it and they understood it, you know. Yeah. And I think as long as you're you're showing genuine hospitality, and, and you know, if you're, it's not as if I was ever trying to make people feel bad, but it was right. like, hey, let's realize that we're both here. Like the worst guest, there's a great bar across the street. You look yeah. like you'd be a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> Please yeah. leave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, that's that's an issue with like some of like the people that really push this crazy hospitality is that like, you know, I've had the conversation where it's like. Right. You're not That's stuck true. here. Right. Like you walk through the door and you sit at the table and you're not happy or, or whatever it is. Like you're not stuck here. I'm not, I haven't told you that you're trapped and that you have to spend $29 on a steak totally. that you're not comfortable doing. Right. So don't worry about it, you know, but like, don't, don't throw attitude at my server or make <laughs> anybody here feel bad about it. You right. Know? Because at any moment you can, you can get up and walk away. Right. And sometimes that's a conversation that people need to realize. It's like, Hey, you vote with your you know, dollars yeah. if you don't like you it. Exactly. And that's where yeah. I'm always at. I vote with my dollars. I'm not going to go and Yelp. I'm not going to do any of that. It's just like, Hey, that place isn't for me. Right. You should be, you know, at an age when you're going out, you're over 21 where you can sort of like figure out like, Oh no, that's, that's not for me. You figure it out pretty quick. Yeah. Experiment a little bit. And then you sort of like, okay, now I'm not really into waiting in lines. I don't wait in lines anymore. Like people start making that and then it just sort of continues. But I think the, you know, that's the thing about drink is that a, you know, it always had a line. Right. Um, and you didn't feel that pressure of like, we've got to, you know, we've got to get people in here. We've got to do this. And it just allowed the fact that people wanted to be there so badly mm. also allowed you to have that freedom. And mm. I think that's just where that breakdown with John, that was just very organic about, Hey, it's not, necessarily always about just like how many different whiskey sours I can make. Sometimes it's about just the whiskey that you're using in that, that same sour. Right. And really just kind of breaking those things down and looking at it. And that sort of brought me back to that kind of wine process of being really analytical about, all right, well, mm. what is the spirit? And, you know, if, if our old fashioned was always old overhaul and then it was like, Hey man, I made an old fashioned with that Elijah Craig Bauer proof the other day. That was like gold. Mm. You have that conversation with someone who's having that and then you give it to them and they're, then they're like, Oh, I didn't even realize that that part of the drink made a difference. Right. You know? And then you really just, you start looking into those things and you're like, Oh, you know, you just had that sort of experimental thing going on and 
you have fun. It's sort of, it's almost like you went from art to science back to art a little bit of <laughs> and it, then you, know? you kind yeah. of found the found yeah. the balance of both and i think like jackson used to bust my balls he's like you know you, you got it all going on you just need to you know you, you probably need like some tattoos and like maybe like <laughs> shave a uh lightning bolt on your face or something like that you know what i mean like i just needed to pick up that like attitude but i was just always just super focused like i i can't pull off attitude if i'm not giving everyone what they need you know? yeah yeah uh, whereas drink it was just sort of you know it just pushed you in that direction of all right, this is, this is how it's going to go. This is how I'm going to do it. I get to direct these people. I get to put pressure back on these people. I love that. Right. You know, and no other place allows you to do that when you're putting menus in front of them. They're basically being like this now, please. Right. Instead of this like, okay. The dialogue. Yeah. So yeah. that was, that was sort of, that was beyond like learning all the drinks and doing all that. That was just something that was really interesting to, to work on psychologically, mm -hmm. just to kind of be like, where can we push people? How should we be pushing people? And I think now leading into from there, transitioning into the towns and it was sort of like coming down here, you know, where basically both Jackson and, and John in that, that whole, you know, guild was in the end of it, you could probably say they were, they, they realized they needed to follow the quality of the kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Like why am I buying mm -hmm. frozen lime juice when the kitchen's doing their ceviche and they're squeezing like, why is this not aligned, you know? Um, that's so smart. And just following like, hey, you know. It makes a difference in the cocktail. That's yeah, so significant. Yeah. And you can literally look Which across so the bougie. planet at a quality of a bar. And if they're doing fresh juice every day, they're a quality bar. Right. Like that's pretty much like if you just had to set one standard, they squeeze fresh juice every day. That's one thing that you could look at and be like, oh. They didn't, they're not doing that by mistake right. because it's more expensive and it's time consuming and it's totally. labor and all that. But totally. it is, it's just one of those things I've always looked at is like, do they squeeze juice fresh every day? How do you feel about well drinks? Well drinks? When they pre-make them and they call them well Batch drinks. Batch drinks? Batch drinks as you call them. Uh, I mean, they make sense for they trigger me. complex tiki drinks. A margarita? you see it. I mean, listen, if you're, if, if I had a business and I was selling fucking 2000 margaritas every day and making a shit ton of money, like, yeah, get them out the door. I mean, I, I think, I think you just can have you keep, to, can you keep the quality though? If you're selling them all and you're not letting it right, sit for fair. three days. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? So I think a, a lot of the batching started, people would be doing it with tiki drinks because it's like, oh, there's 13 ingredients. Like I can't process this fast enough mm. and you have so much sugar instability that when you add it to those it's like okay well we've, we've got this for the day um what know, was your first step in wanting to open this up so i think like i said 25 i started thinking about it wanted to be in boston just thought that like we could change the rules of what was going on I, there was certain things that i just saw within management and style with the corporate stuff that i was like ah we could do something cooler put your it own really, spin on it yeah put your own spin on it it was definitely more of like it was always kind of thinking about like the franklin cafe where it was like Late night, really good quality food mm -hmm. um, with like a really fun wine list that wasn't overpriced. Mm -hmm. That was just sort of where my head was at, where it was like, we don't need to screw everybody on wine. Like we can, we can make it an accessible, fun thing. We can do late night food and it's not, you know, trying to get to a McDonald's or something like that, you know, like yeah. you should be able to go to the Franklin, get a beautiful bottle of, you know, cab for 50 bucks and a bone in filet at 12 30 in the morning after you get off your shift it was like this is yeah gold you know? solid and there was nothing else like it it was in at the time the only franklin was in uh it was in the south end and it was like it was a nightmare to get to there's nothing around there cabbies right. didn't even drive by so it was like you're kind of stranded in this like weird area yeah because that it just nothing was really happening around there at that time and uh that was sort of where we were at but then you were like, oh, to walk through the door, I've got to spend four hundred thousand to five hundred thousand on a liquor license. Mm -hmm. So you start sitting there being like, oh, well, I only really want to have like a sixty or seventy seat restaurant, especially because I in can Boston. Keep my eyes on it, super expensive. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're going to spend a million dollars. You start running your numbers out, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense, right? You know. So then, like you said, you can partition. Went through the whole uh, Southie thing with a couple different properties, and basically the same thing happened. It was like, all right, I'm done here. Yeah. So if my budget is half a million dollars, where is it best spent? And basically it went from looking at the demographics of Southie uh, and Quincy just kind of, I forget how it popped up. Craigslist ad, place down the street for sale, 300 grand, you know, Asian restaurant going out. 
and uh, at the time they were doing uh, a huge development backed by Fidelity, multi-billion dollar downtown investment here, and it fell through. Um, oh, wow. But it hadn't completely fallen through when it came down to look at the business that was here. I did my due diligence. I met one of the realtors down here and was like, hey, I'm looking at this place. You're the broker on it, but like, tell me what's happening here. Like, am I gonna am I gonna go into this place and it's gonna be a construction zone for the next ten years? Because the way that this is gonna happen is nobody really knows, right? Um, and he sort of put it that way. He's like, yeah. He's like, you're probably you know if you're gonna be up there, you're probably gonna need. A, and this is if you go further up Hancock Street, that's where all of it was supposed to happen. Okay. Uh, and it is happening. It's just basically they've they've. Uh, made it easier to pull the permits in there. It's just basically getting done by separate developers instead of one giant one. Totally, yeah. Um, but this is... But it was fully entitled. And this is when we were up. talking six or seven years ago at this point. Yeah. So we said, well, yeah, if you're up there, like you're going to have to worry at a point that your only business is going to be like construction workers. Um, not bad. Awful. <laughs> I mean, awful just in the fact that, you know, it's not what I wanted to do. Right. You know? And when I looked at the market down here, it's, it's you know, the restaurants, it's probably 70% Asian restaurants. Um, huge, strong Asian community, um, a huge Indian community. It probably one of the most diverse cities in New England, mm -hmm. if you really look through it, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you just couldn't really get an idea on, you knew the real estate was starting to bump 15% every year, you know, and we, I basically got, I was going to open houses just to kind of see what things were going for, what the quality was. I realized that Part of the pull for South Boston was that it, it's one of the only places in the city that has beach access and parks. Quincy has the same thing. So I saw a lot of these like mirrored qualities in real estate. Mm -hmm. You get three red line T-stops. Um, and I just sort of kind of had this feeling like, okay, well, if I can go buy a fully operational restaurant down there that's in decent shape with a full liquor license for $300,000... I'm in the right price range. I know that the demographics are pushing down here because I had already had neighbors that were moving to single families here from Southie um, after they had a kid. So you could just kind of see a lot of the pull towards Boston is also kids like me who watched their parents commute shittily for 30 years sure. and would refuse to be like, I know I'm going to work in Boston, but I am not going to drive, you know, an hour, hour in and two hours out every day. Yeah. So you could just tell that that gentrific gentrification was going to happen, that you're going to have these young families. And that's smart. In smart. a very, yeah, in a very basic way to me, it was like, I want to go down there and I want to offer an old fashioned and a daiquiri and a, a decent beer list that people would just coming down here would be really comfortable knowing that it's there. You know, a lot of pull to a neighborhood is just like, I know that my local will give me, I'm not going to get looked at like I'm crazy for asking for a Negroni. You right. Know? Right. And that's really where just the foundation was, is like, let's stick with some classic cocktails that people will recognize and let's do some food that's, you know, comfort and elevated at the same time. Um, and let's just bring that idea of hospitality that we've learned, you know, sort of textbook style in town. Yeah. Because the South Shore and I think a lot of markets, once you get out of the cities, it's sort of like uh, for a long time, it was just superstar chef. Moves out of the city, opens up his own spot. Food's great. Beverage program's a disaster. Right. They've got some liquor rep that comes in and writes it for them. Right. Bartenders don't know what they're doing. Yes. Um, and it's sort of like, ah, that's a bummer because basically every wine that's there is something that you start retail stacked 10 cases high. And it's like, there's just nothing fun about that. It goes back to your juice example, right? Yeah. It's like if you're doing one thing that's indicative of everything else, it's a you win. Can, you can sense it. But yeah. most places, it's like one yeah. or the other. Yeah. It's so terrible. Yeah. I hate to see that. I see it all over LA. I mean, the other, the other part of this is reality. Like my mom was a waitress when we were young and she worked at, you know, it was at Vin and Eddie's down the South Shore. But, you know, that's, that's the beautiful thing about this business as well. Is like you can make your own hours. You can support your family working two or three days a week. Totally. The, the, the tough part about that is that is when you have someone who has a family and a lot of responsibilities who only works two days a week, you're not getting that full commitment, right. you know, and it's really tough. So I knew I didn't want to go past Quincy because I knew I could still draw from Boston, from, you know, the friends that I had in the, in the, that culture and be like, Hey, you know, a lot of you guys are moving down to Dorchester because you can't afford to live in the city anymore. Right. You know, you bought a condo in Weymouth. You've got to drive in town and pay $400 a month to park. And now the commute, which used to be <laughs> so 25 true. minutes is an hour. 
you know, it's sort of like old man problems, but it starts happening to people when they're, you know, in their twenties that are like, this commute sucks. I kept falling asleep when I was doing the commute. <laughs> yeah. <you're, laughs> Cause I'm like stop and go yeah. and every stop. I'm like falling asleep, waking up. Oh God. Oh, and you then, get that <laughs> Tesla, right? Take care of you. Just, needed just the autopilot. Yeah. When you first came here, what was, what was the lease that you had to, did you sign a multi-year lease here? So I did. Yeah. I ended up, um, how did this process go down? I looked, I looked at a space there. I looked at this space. Like I said, I had a big dining room. We, we, we negotiated to have it chopped in half. I didn't really have any great connections. So we hired a lawyer, reviewed the lease. It was a five with two five-year options with okay. a small percentage increase on each option. Yeah. Um, a riser. Uh, so once we hit like 1.2 million, they would start taking 5%. Uh, everything beyond that, which- really Of revenue. Happened. So they, there's a revenue share with them. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and again, I was completely inexperienced. Yeah. Um, and I think the word to the wise there is, is like lawyers are lawyers. They're not business people. Uh, you have to realize like, that's such a can, smart, yeah, you can hand a lawyer a lease and they're going to say, yeah, it's legal. They're not going to say, they're not going to give you advice. By the way, take your base rent, multiply it by, you know, 0.5. That's what you're really paying. Right. Plus this, this, you know what I mean? So you go in just sort of like you run those numbers, um, but they're in the end, they're not ones that are sort of being like, Hey, by the way, they're just this. It's like, yeah, it's a legal document. You're good. They're so, not business people. Yeah. That's so true. And it's, that's, that's so many a, people get that wrong. Lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Even when you're setting up your company, so many people just mess that up and they're like, but my lawyer, I'm like, your lawyer doesn't know anything about your business. Yeah. He has no idea about how to structure yeah. your business. Doesn't know how you're fundraising. Yep. And so, frankly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're doing their job. You just asked the wrong questions. Yeah. And I mean, I was, I was the kid, too, that was like doing like, uh, you know, like score meetings. And like I started meeting up at UMass Boston with one of their, I forget, it's not score, but it's, it's some other business. And even that was just like, at the it's hard. Meetings, I mean, it's, it's like hard. some old retired business guy that's just telling you like, you're fucked no matter what. And it's like, okay, <laughs> great. So I just spent an hour talking to you just to tell me that like, yeah, it's not going to happen. It seems like there's a lot Everyone's of restaurants gonna around sue here. You. Yeah. yeah. And they just, you know, it's, it's, it's this sort of like down feed of you're just like, okay, so you're just going to be tell me everything that's awful. Um, and nobody really wants to talk. So you about wouldn't do that again. You wouldn't do the rev share again. No, I wouldn't do. I wouldn't. I mean, you have to. I, th I sort of what we were talking about it's earlier. It's not as well uncommon. Is, I'll just say that much. You no. shouldn't feel now. It's foolish. now. It's. I think I would have negotiated differently. Yeah. I didn't, so I didn't know that I could. I didn't even know what tenant improvement was. Okay. So when I signed that lease, um, you know, they did some work. They divided the building, but I, in the end of it, to me, I don't fucking care. That's what you were doing to get me in the space. That right. you weren't contributing to me. I could have just found another space. Right. You know? Was there a the, kitchen here? The kitchen was here. Yep. Okay. Um. So that's helpful. It's not because it's, I didn't okay. understand how to fully depreciate things. I okay. didn't go into that kitchen and say, oh, I said, oh, yeah, you know, this two door works. Like if I bought this new, it's like eight grand. Not realizing that it's 20 years old and that in six months is going to be shit in the bed, you know? So, you know, really understanding like, and but, these but, are things that I've learned where it's like, okay. That's a good lesson. Another good yeah, lesson. This learned. equipment. Oh, I've, you know, I've got. I think when we were going through the SBA loan, it was like I put that there was like $40,000 worth of equipment in there. And mm -hmm. it's like in the end of it, there was literally probably $3,000. Right. You know? And the more that I've learned going, you know, checking out auctions. You're saying because of depreciation because it's basically yeah. worthless. Yeah, it's worthless. Yeah, it's already over the point. But the of only, I could have never sold any of it. Right. I could have, you can't everything that it. happened, it got scrapped. I was lucky that someone picked it up for free. That was the value that I got out of it. I didn't have to pay to remove it. You know, yeah. so what do you, hey, what that's do you good get value. There? Those yeah. things are pretty big. Yeah. That's not terrible. But you know, you just don't, you don't know. You're naive. You, you know, you think everyone has the best intentions and, but it's also, they don't know. Like yeah. sometimes you're just yeah. dealing with other people who have no idea, yeah. especially landlords. I mean, yeah. if they're not running restaurants. Oh, and I mean, landlords, bankers. I mean, yeah. the, when I was going through the, the SBA loan was a, was a total nightmare, but you know, in the end of it, it helped secure a lot of equity for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I just was able to leverage and that that's probably the best thing I ever did. The 10% down SBA? It was, um, or what? Yeah, I think oh, it was, it was a business loan, the business loan. Yeah. yeah. 10%, 10 years. It's an expensive loan, but again. Is it? it yeah. Yeah, for your closing costs and everything else like that. Yeah. I okay. Think it probably was like an extra, 
I want to say they said it was like maybe like an extra five to seven thousand dollars. Okay. You know, which when you're only really, you know, I was able to leverage that we had bought the condo in Southie, which went way up. So, you know, we made the right decisions prior to getting into the business to be able to keep as much equity as we had. Yeah. But, you know, they put a uh they put a lien on your house if you sell it. You know, there's just a lot of things that just come attached with Personal it. guarantees. And yeah. people get into the well, you know, if you just get a whole bunch of uh private investors, everybody just gets to walk away if it goes the wrong way. If you get the bank loan, you're sort of mm. handcuffed to it. Maybe. And at the time I didn't I didn't have the the outreach to fund it, you know. Yeah. So it, and I also was I was just so scared to ask for people for money. Yeah. So I was scared to just not that I was scared, I just didn't want to ask. I don't like asking for things. I don't like getting favors. It just it was never part of me. It was always this hustle, make it your own and earn it. Um which now I look back and it's like that's backwards. Like, you know, people believe in you and they want to invest in you. You should throw it out there and you know, make it happen. But, yeah. People buy into what you're trying to build. Yeah. They try it. They but buy it's hard into to get concept. over it because then you also have to get into that self-marketing and you know, it's yeah. for me, it was turn always on a like, different it's switch. Not, yeah. It's, it's just was always kind of like, so it was like, I wanted to bring in the minimal stuff. I wanted people that I, I knew and cared about to be a part of the process. Um, what other lessons learned did you have here? <clears throat> lots of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they continue. I think definitely, like I said, the original lease that I signed, yeah. um, I should have, I should have known about tenant improvement. Yeah. Um, I probably would have been at the same numbers and had an extra hundred thousand dollars to, to, to finish it. Instead, we, you know, we finished in the, in the hole, I probably was 40 or 50 grand over budget. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're, you know, you're getting up and operating and you're just, it's just gone. There's nothing, there's no stabilization. There's nothing. And, you know, you, you do have that sort of like first six months of energy where you're, you're doing numbers and, but we, we weren't, it wasn't done. It wasn't a finished product. Yeah. You know, we, we came in, we fired the designer almost immediately. Why? And then she, she, um, <laughs> she, she just wasn't actively participating in it. And it was sort of like, and again, being naive, like I've never worked with a designer before, you know, ever. Yeah. So you start going through the process, they get recommended, you do the reach out, you sit down, okay, you seem cool, these are some projects that you've done, but you never really know, you know, where people are at in their life. And I think like she had just had a kid and she started just kind of coming in and being like, oh, okay, well, here's this website, go on that and find some lighting that you like, pick mm. out like three and then print them up and bring them in and we'll discuss it. And here's, uh, here's some paint swabs pick out some and then next time I'm here, I'll tell you which walls we should put them on. And I, and I was just sort of like, and I started talking to my contractor and he was like, what the fuck is going on here, you know? Yeah. And it just got to the point where it was like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'll just yeah. say this much. One thing I've learned that there's a lot of designers and then there's architects and yeah. like the designers, there's so many of them and I'll just be blunt. They're all shit. <laughs> They all suck. They yeah. all think they're somebody. They yeah. all think they know design. Yeah. Very few of them went to design school. Very few of them know like design principles. Yeah. They were just fortunate to have this one project. Yeah. And then fortunate to have someone recommend yeah. them. Yeah. But they don't know anything. Yeah. And they don't care about your business. Yep. They're not trying to figure out like what's the total feel, what's yep. the menu. They're not yep. trying to fit into your concept. Yep. They're just trying to get their paycheck. Absolutely. And get the fuck out. Absolutely. And it's just so reckless to me. It's like, yeah. just care a little bit. Yep. Now with our new project, uh, we were able to get the Katzes who've done like kind of Barbara's projects. And, you know, the the price is significantly more. Yes. But we're getting like the, the professionalism, the on-site, the, you know, here's three of these, here's three of these, here's three of these, let's put this together. And just even just the communication. Right. It's like, it's... One thing I think as as I was thinking, and again, like the mistakes that I made was like, you know, your designers almost because if you don't realize it, you're not looking at the value that they can bring. And you're like, that's where I cut corners. Where can I get a cheap architect? Where can I get a cheap designer? Mm -hmm. You know, because in some cases you just look at designers as like, well, they know how to get things that I can't, you know, that, that is kind of part of their curriculum where it's like, oh, I know how to source items that you won't know how to. Sure. And I can show you these things. Sure. And then you can pick them out. Or it's like, <laughs> you know, actually having people put it together, be on site, meet with, you know, meet with your, your, uh, your contractor and, and get it done. You yeah. Know? So it, it's, it's those things where it's like spending the money on the lawyer, spending the money, the, the things that you don't really want to do, but 
you should probably be like doubling or tripling your budget on that when you first, because those are the lines you want to pinch, you know, yeah. like, oh, well, you know, opening costs off opening this, like there's all these law firms we work with. And sometimes like some are double the other ones yeah. in terms of cost. And so people will ask me like, well, why would you ever work with them? Yeah. And I always tell people because they can make a phone call yep. to a very important person yep. that makes my project move forward yep. or not. And when you start talking about... And that's real, like by yeah, the time that yes. phone call needs to be made, yep. I'm all in. This isn't the World Series of Poker. Yep. Like I'm there. My best friend yells at me all the time. <laughs> he's like, just get a firm. He's a lawyer. And I always call him like, you know, he's our, our HR director. <laughs> yeah. Like shit goes down. It's like, hey, Justin, what's going on? Yeah. And he's always just been like, hire a firm. Because you always go to cut costs and you, you hire a single lawyer. And that's not to say that they're all bad. But it depends, what, it depends of, on the use, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you want like an LLC set up, yeah. sure, go cheap. Yep. Yeah. But if you want some like Your legit partnership agreements, all those things, you're going to get them in half the time. There's not going to be as much back and forth. Right. And yeah, you spent double, but in the end of it, like you got to start looking at the returns on being open two weeks earlier. Yes. And actually having a revenue stream than just like, oh no, it's fine. He, he's going to be ready in three weeks. And it's like, what else are we doing here? We can't move forward without a partnership agreement. Like right. what is going on? So yeah, I mean, though it's just, it, it's tough because you just, you're always, you know, the first one, I think you're just, you're so in tune with every detail and just trying to make sure that, you know, you're squeezing to get it done. You know, yeah. you just need to get it off the ground. Yeah. And we did, but this place was like, I look back and I'm, we have some old pictures of like the front and in here. And I, I'm always just like, Oh God, like, <laughs> it would have been nice to have a finished product. It's still not even finished. I mean, we still got lights to install up there. And, you know, we've done what we can do with the space. But that all, like I said, that leads to the original negotiation of, you know, what was going on at the time. And the building had just been purchased by Related Beal. I don't think they really wanted to invest too much money into it because Quincy was still kind of, you know. They were unsure, yeah. Yeah, this was their first step down here. And, again, they're a giant real estate holding company. Um, Did they vet you pretty hard at all? They did. I mean, they were psyched because, it, you know, again, Barbara Lynch, Garrett Hart, like all right. that. They, they hear that stuff and it's like, that's what we want in our building. Yeah. Um, Devin's a G. Let's get him in. You know, there, and there's risk in that for them as well. But I also didn't really vet what was in the building. Like, I didn't realize that, you know, I love the college that's here, but it's not, you know, it's not like being at Island Creek with BU across the street with sure. a bunch of kids with dough and, and professors making bank. Right. You know, it's... It's a city college. It's a it's a community college. I you know our right right. If I'm charging twelve bucks for a burger at lunch, it's like, nope, way too expensive. Yeah, you know. Um, so that's half the building. And, and then, you talked about making your portions bigger too, right? Because the people here expect a certain size yeah, portion. Yeah, I mean, it again. It, it's just it's been such an interesting, which is so interesting to think about. Yeah. right? it's like portions matter. They do. They got to fit the community. Because <laughs> people like to feel like they got a bang for their buck. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you're paying $12 for a burger yeah. and you're a poor college kid, like you want that burger to be like a half pound. It better be leftovers. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Give me the box of leftovers. Yep. And again, you can race towards the bottom and, and give people that. But I think that was our whole point here was no. Yeah. Like we're going to hold a line of quality. And the people that recognize that quality are the people that I want here. Yeah. You know, I think what it, one of the definitely some of the things that you learn about what product you put out is what people come to you. Right. And if you don't like the fact that like there's bar fights and like, you know, a bunch of horrible shit happening in your restaurant, like <laughs> you're probably not putting out the right product that you want to be dealing with. Like you, you can look around at the bars I had worked at before where it was like, you know, maybe they were considered high end. I don't, you know, I never really looked at drink as being like a high end thing, mm -hmm. but it, it was curated and people are either attracted to that or they're kind of not. Yeah. And the people that are, it, you know, it was some of the most stimulating guests that I would ever have. Yeah. And I think here it was like holding that line of quality. The riffraff kind of bailed, right? Like, Oh, you're not going to make it. You guys suck. This drink's too small. It's like, <laughs> okay, thank you. You know, like have a nice life. We don't have to deal with you. It's ever not again. for you. Yeah. Yeah. It almost <laughs> makes it simple. What was opening day like here for you once you got everything in, Oh, in opening line. day. <laughs> Did everything break? What happened? So here's the story. Opening day, we were recommended. This is our uh, opening day friends and family. Um, okay. So your soft opening. Soft opening. Yeah. We've got Bobby Sisson, 
uh, my like all of our families are coming this day. And um, I didn't get the invite, by the way. Just in case no, you're you didn't. You were gone. You, you abandoned. <laughs> you didn't me. know. You're, you're neither a friend. I was nor outside. A I was driving by, <laughs> and there it was like open but closed. Yeah. It was weird. So we um, we got this recommendation for this server, and we we needed to fill a hole. And she came in, and we're like, okay, she seems she seems like she gets it. She had worked in town, and we did. Josh and I did a quick interview. We're like, okay, great. Tomorrow we've got some training. We'll do we'll do our a mock service training. So opening day, we're all here at probably you know. I've been forever, but staff gets here around noon. We're getting set up. We're going through the menu. And I think around like two o'clock, I should say no, around like 3.30, we realize like she's gone. <laughs> and, uh, what? And I'm like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, maybe she just got nervous, you know, because we're, you know, there's a lot of pressure. We're, we're, we had a very small menu, but that was our expectation. It's like, hey, this is like, we've got 10 wines We've got like twelve food items. Like, yeah, you guys gotta you gotta nail this. Like we're we're doing this easy, and that's what we wanted it to be. You know, just just know your shit about what's here. There's not a lot of it. So, and for I think a lot of people that weren't used to the culture of just like learning on the fly and being able to do it, mm -hmm. they they got nervous. So we were just like, oh, you know, maybe we lost her. So, chef's family comes in right at. I want to say we we probably started at like four. And um, everyone's the first, we're doing one full turn at basically five o'clock. It's like, okay, come in like 4.30 to 5.30. We'll have all of our family, grandparents, everyone. And uh, Bobby's family comes in, they sit over here and his mom gets up and she goes into the women's room, which the rest of the staff was guys. So we hadn't even been in there. And this girl is passed out unconscious in the friggin' stall. <laughs> And it's just immediately is like people are starting to show up. She's unresponsive, uh, you know, and the stall's locked. So all you can kind of see is her legs. So, she, so Bobby's mom comes out and she's like, uh, you know, just, just hands up and, you know, just. Just a heads up. There's a yeah, fucking yeah. body in the bathroom, <laughs> Devin. Yeah. So you killed someone. Call the ambulance. Oh, my God. They're here God. fast. She, I, I don't, I don't really know what the hell she did, but she, she either like drank too much or who knows what the hell happened. Yeah. You know, dehydration. Just, who knows? Yeah. 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 Definitely not that. <laughs> uh, so I'm sitting there, I have everyone making phone calls to all family members. And I'm like calling my brother and my parents, like, just pull over the side of the road. Well, what do you mean? Just, just pull over the side of the road. Don't come here right now. Don't come here right now. Because they, you know, I, I think there's probably, they only ended up being probably about a dozen people, but She's getting wheeled out through the yeah. middle of the dining room <laughs> on a stretcher. <laughs> and so are you serious? Not like, the opening oh, image yeah. you pictured. It was unbelievable. I literally poured myself like four ounces of rum <laughs> as she was getting wheeled out the door. It was just like, boom. I don't mean to laugh, but and that's like, fucking great. Uh, and it was like, all right, let's go. Oh, that's it was unfortunate. Awful. What was she okay? She ended up being fine. I think she. I think she probably had an alcohol problem, or I have, I have no idea. She just disappeared, and it was like, who knows? I didn't even. You didn't check. <laughs> no, I mean, we checked back because we knew the person who had recommended them to us. So we, we were sort of like, hey, we made the calls, and you know, we did our due diligence to make sure that everyone was oh. fine. She ended up fine, all that, but it was just like one of those like. This is how it begins, you know? Like what the <laughs> fuck just happened? A potty in the restroom. It was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I literally. I, so I, she was I, drunk. You're saying? She I was, think she. I, yeah, yeah. She might have been drinking. She just passed out. I don't know. I still don't know. I never. It was. It was just like. I didn't even. I haven't even thought about that until you asked me what the first day was like. I, I buried it so far. Like, get rid of this. Um, <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. You can't make that up. No, it was crazy. So. So then what happened? We, just, <laughs> we went into a good night. You know, we just we. we you gave we her had, a promotion. Yeah. Yeah. She's Tier gone. one. She, she's now the general manager. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She came back strong. Oh, that poor soul. It's uh. That's brutal. That stuff happens though. You know, especially there's a lot of stress in the restaurant business. There's you know there's obviously a lot of abuse of drugs and everything else like that. So I don't know about you know, two thirty in the afternoon on a. <laughs> on a grand opening what's going on but hey i so guess how, well, how was your grand opening then so that was your soft opening Grand opening was good pick up. um no no bodies no ods no bodies <laughs> no ods yeah we escaped we escaped the next week um we did good numbers i remember 
Um, <laughs> That's outstanding. You know, it was sort of like we. I think it was like, oh, we did, you know, thirty five hundred on Friday, and nobody even knows we exist. We didn't have a sign. We didn't have anything, you know. And it was just sort of like a little bit of local press. Um, yeah, I saw some press about you. Yeah. You were getting some press. Yeah, yeah. I think um, based on the team. Yeah, right. The team was getting a lot of high praise. Drink coming Palmer, down. You. Yeah, and, and again, you'll hear that said all the time, but you know, the, the pinnacle restaurants in town, like if you work for them, you get a little bit of that, you know, esteem behind and be like, Oh wow. Yeah. They're coming here. And I think it was, we got a little bit more press too, because we weren't necessarily going like, Oh, this is all about great food. We were going the route of, you know, it's a great both. We're going to have three kids that were just on drink bar coming down to Quincy. Yeah. What the fuck are they doing? You know? And that was, that was just kind of part of it where we were like, Hey, listen, we just want to, we just want to bring good quality products down here and make sure that people are happy. And, Really just try to fill in the void culturally and also just fill in the void of like product that for people that are coming down this way. So it's so smart. I mean, so being in real estate development, one of the things that I'm always thinking about is just because something's in a city center doesn't mean it doesn't belong or the people outside of the city center don't want it. Right. Yeah. And it's really, but for some reason people think it's, it's almost genius or like novel that all you did was bring it to them. Yeah. When it's like they wanted it the whole time. Yeah. They've been driving there the whole time. Yep. Right. They're either working there anyway. Yep. And so everyone wants it. All yep. you're doing is moving it a little bit closer to them and maybe putting your own spin on it so that it yep. feels like it's theirs. Yep. But it's the same people. Like there's plenty of yep. people in Quincy. There's plenty of people that work in Boston that come here. And so it's like a, it's almost easy. You know what I mean? When you look at like the, the numbers, it's easy in the sense of the demand is already there. And the big cities have have kind of validated it. Yeah. Right? Clearly, it, it works in the big city. Not everyone's living there. And so it takes, it, it takes like, a, it's a risk. But for the entrepreneur, the restaurateur, someone like you who picks up on that, yeah, it's, it's like they already want it. It's, yeah. it's a market that's already there. You just have to bring it to them in the right way. And I, th I think, yeah, on top of that point, too, is, you know, there's still such a lack of that kind of culture coming down into the South shore that like I start to think and then I'm like, Oh, we're still really far ahead of the game. You know, we still have mm. so much more market share to grasp. We still have so much more to teach people, you know? And I think in terms of what, which, which, which well, direction I mean, teach, in terms sometimes of food, teaching cocktails. People is, yeah. I mean, all of it really. But I think for the most part, the thing that, that pushes us forward is the cocktails. Okay. Um, like I said, I think, you know, having some steak tartare and a, and a bone marrow and like really well executed food like that. You know, yeah. there's an attraction to that because it's not, you don't see as much of it around here. And I think just the, the clean execution of the quality ingredients that we use, you know, I, I can go and get chicken on risotto really anywhere. The further South you go, it's probably like a pound of risotto. That's not necessarily cooked that well. And it's sure. a giant, you know, uh, mass produced, statler chicken thing on it that's just like you know that you could tell that that chicken couldn't walk kind of deal you know right and you put out it was on the bathroom floor for a few hours ago. yeah its legs are broken and <laughs> but you bring in like the gno chicken and you're not really spouting it out there but you'll get the people that are just like that's like the best chicken i've ever had right and it's like well yeah these birds are they're treated really well they're they're not nine pound chickens that are you know <laughs> that you just have to cook so long and yeah. so far and when we do them under the brick you know that sort of like dark meat fat goes up in the white it, it, and it's just it's a great piece of chicken it literally comes under the brick by the way it does yeah, yeah they serve you it with get the through the brick first but um <laughs> but people recognize it and they don't know why they recognize it and that's you know i always go back like when we when we opened with chef bobby so many guests that would come in here had never had roasted beets. They had only had them out of a can. Mm. And you'd hear, my move was like, I would hear them at a table and be like, oh no, I don't eat, I hate beets, never liked them. Right. And I would send out these like beautiful baby, you know, red and yellow candy stripe roasted beets on some whipped ricotta with honey. Like as simple Fire. as it gets. So you know what I mean? delicious, yeah. It's so simple. Carrots too. There it is. Banger. Right? And then they'd be like, Oh, you know, and kind of, give, and then all of a sudden they're like, I, I didn't even, I didn't even realize, you know, and those are the moments that you kind of have, you can't take for granted because you can in Boston, but you realize like the demographic switch is so fast Yeah, um, that for so many people, it's important still for them to realize like, you know, this is where a mark of quality goes. As we were saying before, like a lot of, 
restaurants just shop towards the bottom to keep prices down. Right. And we were never really going to do that. We were running up super high food costs because we wanted people to understand what chefs in town were using. Right. Um, and just get that switch of them mentally to be like, this isn't like a salad that has like some, uh, you'd always see these salads with like a, you know, like your chopped cabbage. And then they'd put like four mixed greens on top of it to make like it was full with some like carrot sticks, you know, <laughs> that's the house salad. You want the dressing on the side kind of thing, you know? And, and, and that's not, uh, that's not a kick against anybody, but sometimes that's just all people have experienced. But I feel like that's also an education that after the first time they have it, they'll never forget it. It only takes once. Yeah. And yep, then right. they're going to remember the beets dish and the yep. chicken under the brick. Yep. You know, that sticks with you. And you create, what we get to do is create expectations. Right. Right. Like they come in here, they get an old fashioned that's on a hand cut piece of ice. Right. That doesn't have an orange in there and a cherry and isn't completely fucked. And, <laughs> you, and you get to tell them, not only do I get to tell them why we like it, but I get to start, you know, if I want to, and it seems like they're receptive, be like, hey, well, you know, in 1809, Blah, 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 and regurgitate some drink knowledge on them. And they're like, I had no idea. And this is the best old fashioned I've ever had. And it's like, great, because when you go out to, you know, I don't really, no one's really a competitor, but like right. when you're down the street and you want that old fashioned, you're not going to get it. Yeah. And you're going to understand why. And it's not, it's going to have a know, red that, cherry that's, in it. Yeah. And that's, that's part of like, okay, that's my sting towards my competition is that like, if I know that's where I'm better, I'm going to, I'm going to let you know. You know, there's a reason why we do this. There's a reason why we have that block of ice. There's a reason why this is there. There's a reason why those beats are good. There's, you know what I mean? They're not canned. They're not processed. And right. you create the expectation for them high enough that they don't want to fall back. You know, yeah. and then they go out and they start, they start being analytical about what they're eating because they get it and they're like, oh, why wasn't it as good? And, you know, people don't, they do now more than ever, but people don't necessarily always think about, I think when we were just talking about, there is a direct line between uh, quantity and quality. And I've thought about it so often being in this market. It's so tricky because, again, you've got these super loyal blue collar families that have been here for generations. You know, they're loyal to what's around them. <laughs> there it is. Sorry, that's your birthday, too. <laughs> Nick, Nick, uh, Devin just poured us we some have wine more. and Nick got nothing. Nick got screwed. Nick got screwed. Sorry. We found him in the bathroom. I'll be all right. I'm just going to go smell the tenants. There's more. <laughs> You can taste them. You can taste them. Yeah. But I think you, you know, you still have like a direct correlation to like depression era. Like my grandfather used to like crack chicken bones. You know what I mean? It's like mm. you have people that went without and quantity that culture is, is still... that sort of answer to them. And yeah. that's, that's through even the boomer generation where it's like they, you know, it persists. And there's still a piece of that, even if you look at like your sweet green and stuff like that, where it's like, yeah, that was 13 bucks, but I'm going to eat half now and then I'll have half later. So there's value in it, right? People still find value in mm. quantity. You know, a $15 salad is kind of absurd if you think about going through those lines and doing it. But for the most part, they're going to be like, <laughs> they're goes just that. down his sip of wine. <laughs> There is a point where it's going to go in the fridge at work and they're going to have it for dinner or they're going to have it for lunch the next day. Right. So there's people still have that sight line of like, okay, you know, it's not all kind of like the like tiny persnickety like, oh, look at how that was made and that was a $20 bite. Like that's right. That's a different level, you know, to be doing that. Whereas the quantity quality is like you, you have to you have to get them so they're they're happy with what they got. They left full but they didn't leave bagging up half the food right? and just sort of like, Oh, this is great. I get to eat it tomorrow. And when we, you know, market research, but when we moved out of Southie, we wanted to keep our condo. So we moved in with my wife's in-laws in Whitman while we were searching for a house around here. Okay. And, um, while we were down there in Whitman, which is about Whitman's probably 30 miles South of the city. It's where I grew up. We go to the restaurants around there and it, we just learned that you could, if we were both getting an entree, you, you did not order an appetizer. Just one. Because if you did, it it's was way like, too much. Yeah. And you're used, we were used to just like you eat the food that comes out. Yeah. And it, it would be like, I can't, like we're done. Like yeah. we just ate, we had a piece of bread and we had this giant, you know, you see these <laughs> fucking meatballs or like a softball that comes out. You're like, what is, what is this? You know, who does this? <laughs> yeah. But that's just part of like, again, that's them getting that clientele that's, 
that's going. That's used to that. And, and there's there's nothing. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Like I said, if, if I had a business that I just knew, I've got buses of uh, of older retirees coming every day. And right. Like, you would and, cater and, that. And when they're gone, I'm going to close my business up and retire. Like then that's fine, you know. Right. So, but there, there just is that correlation where, where we in, in this area have always had to kind of figure out. And then it's like we have the 3A where there's like money and Cohasset and Hingham and that area that comes up and thinks that we're their little like South End Bistro. And it's, it's great business, you know. So we, and they're the ones that will come in and have a $200 bottle of wine. Like, yeah, you're kind of at like the border crossing of these markets. Yeah. So it's always been such a interesting thing for us to be like getting, we get Dorchester coming down. You know, you've, you've got people that meet, that live in Boston, that are meeting their friends from the Cape. Yeah. Um, and we, we have to, we have to find, oh, we're always positioning for that balance to be like, okay, how are we making sure that each market is, is happy and that there's enough food, but there's also enough refinement and quality without either having a ridiculous food and labor cost and just find it, you know? How does this all translate to your next location? So you're, 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 you're going to open something new. Yep. Second thing here in Quincy. Yep. What um, is, uh, what can you tell us about it? Pearl and lime. Um, obviously right now the Boston market's exploding. Pearl with, and lime? Pearl and lime. That's what yeah. it's called? Yep. Okay. Latin, Latin kitchen. Um, Latino? Sure. <laughs> Whatever you want it to be. Latin X? Latin X. Yeah. Um, there's, there's an explosion of, of, uh, taco latin restaurants opening in boston it's probably been about 20 in the past three years yeah you look at it wow um obviously the quality of the ingredients that people were putting out tacos and stuff with in the past was always just sort of like oh dump out a can of chopped tomatoes and we just never really had mm -hmm. good like west coast latin style tacos and stuff and now you're starting to see people like they're really figuring it out for me looking in this market there's a 20 year old latin spot that's been dead for 15 years. That's just like, here's a shitty quesadilla. Here's, you know, again, your tomatoes are getting pulled out of a jar. It needs right. to go. Right. But it's the, you know, it's not just about, it doesn't always have to just be about, like, well, this is what I'm super passionate about. Like, we looked at it and it was like, this makes sense here because the demographic calls for it and there's nothing doing it. If we wanted to do an Asian restaurant, there's already 90 of them, you know? Right. If we were doing this new American, ah, well, four of them have opened since we've opened, you know? So, it's part of culture now. I mean, that food is part of culture. Yeah. And what you're doing is just making it more, it's you're adding the freshness, it's a, you're you adding, know, yeah. you're, you're bringing the care that it kind of deserves and it's yeah. been neglected yeah. here in the market. That's sort of business in a, in a bubble right there anyways, right? Is like something's been fine. Right. You know, and then someone comes in and says, well, you know, I think we can, we can make the adjustment and push these guys out or do what needs to be done. And that's, that's just what we looked at around here was like, all right, well, we've got a lot of 30-year-old Mexican restaurants, and it's time to go. <laughs> they don't squeeze fresh juice, you know? It's like that type of a thing. So what are you going to do after this one? After this one? So you're going to have two coming here soon. When, when's the grand opening, roughly, of the next one? It'll be probably mid-February. Okay, yeah. so pretty soon. If you need me to go and get drunk and pass out in your bathroom, I'm available. I like that. Especially for the soft. Hired. Yeah. Hired and fired. <laughs> It's, it's already been a fun project. It's one of those things where... So on that one, you got a TI allowance. <clears throat> some lessons yep, learned. We right? did. You got a nice TI allowance. So what kind of lease did you sign there? We definitely did. You know, we earned it here. You know, and again, the town yeah. seems like this whole area was a war zone. The first three years were like literally just kind of like sinking your nails into the wall and, and just making sure you were holding on. It's a visual. Um, yeah, it was brutal. It really was. It was just sort of like, okay, I won't pay myself the next month. And you, then you just kind of figure it out. You know, you, you really get deep into it. It's like, where's, where's our labor fluctuations? Where, you know, you, and things that, you know, if we're in the right location at the right time and you're fully in a saturated area and, and it's like you're just busy right off the bat, which you can have in town. Yeah. But you also need the funding and everything else to get there. So it's always, it's a, it's always a sort of tough back and forth to figure out like, well, I didn't have a million dollars. So right. this is where we started. So we scrapped. And, you know, so far we're, we're winning. And basically what happened down there was one of the old drink regulars uh, bumped into Palmer. And he was a real estate guy that was part of the, uh, the managing group of this new West of Chestnut project. And he had basically said, well, 
the burger place that's in there is going out of business. They didn't understand the clientele that was above them. Sure. And they didn't cater to it. Sure. Um, they didn't recognize people that lived in the building. They didn't dim their lights at night. They didn't have the music on properly. They just, they just couldn't really get it together. And they didn't even make two years. So when we went in, they, like I said, they, the, the building management and them were, were very frank with us and we're like, well, we know what you guys can do. And they're, you have to imagine that. So this was four years after we opened here. Their base rent was the same as here. We did a 10 year That's straight great. lease. Yeah. Um, I believe with a five year option afterwards, small, small, I think it's a 2% increase, Every but we also got $50. Great. Yeah. We got $50 a square foot and 10 improvement probably could have gotten more, but then like That's great. even just through a mistake, it was like, they asked us how much free rent we would need. And we we're like, well, you know, four months to build it out. And like, okay. But it was already a sign that they were giving us three months to start. So we ended up getting seven months free rent. That's perfect. And it was just like, this is, you know, wild. And then with this, we, we got the right people. We get pretty much everyone that is invested has been a regular at the bar, knows what we're doing, felt secure about what they were doing, that we were still here, that we made it in this market, that we right. made it through everything, went here. And uh, we were able to fully fund the thing in, I think, like six weeks. That's great. Um, so going into it, the confidence of like not being locked down with uh, a crazy lease, having the tenant improvement, having the free rent, and really not having the the bill from the bank every month. Right. You know, like these guys are going to get paid back. Right. But they're going to get paid back when we say that we're ready to pay them back. Right. You know, we're not going to strangle ourselves in the interim. So it's nice just to be like, well, we don't have that three to $5,000 bill from the bank every month that if we don't pay, we're fucked. It's like, all right, great. First quarter, we did this. We're going to expect this in the second quarter. If we want to shoot out some dividends, we'll shoot out dividends. That's just a nice feeling. Totally. You know? You're in control. As we roll into 2020 here, so for me, it's always a time to like reflect and think in, yeah. think in decades, right? It's yeah. like you're kind of your refresh. Yeah. What is it for you? What are you, who is Devin in 2030? What are you guys, what's the vision? Um, you got two spots that'll be open here soon, right? Until you'll close the decade. I guess open the decade with two locations. Yeah. We'll have two here. I definitely, I'll be interested in another project. Obviously, you know, pro ideally give ProLM the year or two that it needs. Yeah. The kind of cool thing about Quincy in the market is that like nothing really fully exists. Like there's no French bistro, you know, there's, there's, there's so much of the market that as it, as it sort of moves, that's available to it, mm -hmm. you know? So there's a lot of creative that's still like, that's kind of what drives me in these deals and, and finding the deals and going through is kind of being like, you know, like what is the thing that we can do here? What makes this place better than the other? You know, what can we bring here that's new and different and exciting? Yeah. But in the end of it, in reality, looking at 2020 to 2030, um, I want to own my own property. I want to be, you know, I do want you to get to the point. You want to own your building. Where, yeah. yeah. I want a building. I, I've seen the restaurateurs that bought their building, ran their business for 15 years, and then they sell their business and they're a landlord and they're making more money than they were. Than they ever, While running than they the ever, business. Than they ever had the business. Yeah. And I just, I think, as we discussed before, like I'm, you know, put it out there where like I'm not looking to get rich. I'm looking to sort of find that independence and the things that can pay me to be what I want to do when I want to do it. So yeah, I think that's free. That's, that's where I want to be. That's where I see myself. And I, I think I love that. I don't, I like real estate. I like that I can walk on top of it and that it's there. And I think that I'm very sort of bullish on this market. Mm -hmm. I think Boston's been undervalued for a very long time. And Still I think that is. I think so. I, I think if you look at compare it to some of the other markets, like I think so. San Fran, you know, and you used to still have this building biotech and financial and education and just the hospitals in general, it's, it's insane. You yeah. Know? And it's insane that you could 10 years ago, you could be buying, you know, a condo three blocks from Kenmore for 250 grand. And now yeah. that condo is $750,000. Yeah. You know, so it's still rolling and you know, I just, I'm, I'm always interested in real estate, but I, in the, in the end of it, it's, I, I want to, you know, you I own know, the building. I think if you're in the restaurant business, you, you have to realize that you can't do it forever. Right. In the, in the same capacity, That's you can smart. be a, a part of it. And you, you know, and I've seen and, and known many great restaurateurs into their sixties and, and early seventies, but there's, you have to have enough insurances behind you that are right. something else 
to just kind of be able to wander through and, you know, shake hands and do that type of thing. I realize that, you know, this business also can eat you alive. So you need to, you need to make sure that while you're doing it and, and while you have the ability to, to make that money and you have all that, you know, charisma and, and all these things you want to do that you're looking down the line to be like, I already know now. Yeah. Like you I've know, got, the exit. I've got a six and a four year old, you, you know, know, the last chapter. And it's, it's one of those things where you, you do have to realize that you have to step back, which is probably one of the hardest parts. But I, I remember, I always remember the story that was on like NPR about this guy who had won uh, a Nobel Peace Prize for something. Okay. And the gist of it was basically like, yeah, I'm the very best in the world at this right now, but I haven't seen my kid in six months. Yeah. You know, and it's the sort perspective of like, is real. Yeah. I'm not that good of a dad. I'm not the best dad in the world. So I think it's, you know, you, you have to find that balance because if you don't, it's really easy to be passionate about food and wine and, and all these things and find the next venture and go. But you, you they, do have to. They say you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. Exactly. And there's exactly. a balance in that. Yeah. Where can people find you? Tell people where they can find you. Obviously, the town center here in Quincy. Come hang out. Come yep. have a cocktail. Come Towns eat some good Quincy. food. Pearl and Lime down the line. Towns and Quincy. So we are on the red line. Uh, which is the major line for Boston when it works. Uh, we're right across the street <laughs> from the Quincy Center. Uh, and they get a new beautiful common outside. You know, it's, it's, it's coming along here. It's fun to see the growth. Fun fact, yeah. the, uh, the Adams family is buried yep. across the street. My crew. Yep. Your crew. In Not tuned. the TV show. A couple Adams presidents. Family. Yep. John Hancock was born about An Abigail. 100 yards from here. The Adamses, this was part of their farm. Uh, you got one of the largest Revolutionary War cemeteries. You got two presidents entombed next to each other, which is nowhere else, I think, in the country. Never mind that they were literally across the street. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. crazy. We uh, should have some some music going when we exit this interview. You know, the little <laughs> I'll, I'll have a, a drummer boy, a fight yeah, yeah. player. Thanks for coming on the podcast, brother. Thanks for coming down here. I know it's slow for you guys. So, hey, man, happy to do it. Thanks, All the Devin. way from the West Coast. All Thanks, the guys. way. Thank you, you bet. We're freezing our asses off. <laughs> We here at Startup the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think, either through rating us on the podcast app or by sliding into our DMs. You can find us both on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. Our theme song is composed by Double Touch. If you want to learn more about the products and businesses featured on today's episode, check out the links in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, consider subscribing because we've got a lot more great guests coming up that you won't want to miss. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.